Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Smaller. I'm the Director of Educational Programs here with the Journey Through Hallowed Ground. And today we are continuing our journey throughout the heritage area, and we are joined today by the Education Technician at Eisenhower National Historic Site. So Daniel, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome virtually to Eisenhower National Historic Site. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us here today and taking some time to learn about our site here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, what we're gonna do is take a little bit of time and have an introduction to the site, learn a little bit about our story here and why the Eisenhower National Historic Site matters so much. And we'll have some time for some Q&A, uh, some questions here towards uh, a little bit later on in our program. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen here. All right. So again, uh, my name is Dan Vermilia. I'm an education technician, one of the uh, park rangers here at Eisenhower site. And I'm very happy to have everybody uh, doing this virtual visit with us here today, uh, here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, our site here, this is, this is the only home that Dwight and Mamie Eisenhower ever owned. These are two very important figures in 20th century American history, world history. They lived in many places throughout their lives together. But Gettysburg, in this uh, photograph that you're seeing here, this uh, white brick house here in Gettysburg, it's the only place they ever actually called home. And our homes tend to say something very uh, personal about who we are. They reflect our characteristics, our personalities. And we think our site here in Gettysburg, the Eisenhower National Historic Site, preserving the Eisenhower home and the farm lands around it really speaks to who the Eisenhowers were as individuals. And I'd like to take you through their story here a little bit as we begin our program. So Dwight Eisenhower first came to Gettysburg uh, in 1915 with his West Point class. That was the year he graduated from West Point. Many members of that class went on to become generals in the United States Army. It's known as the class the stars fell on. Uh, this is a class picture taken on the steps of Christ Lutheran Church here in town. And as I like to remind our school groups who come and see us, Dwight Eisenhower first came and visited Gettysburg as a student himself, as a cadet at West Point. So there's, there's Ike for us right in the middle of the screen, uh, highlighted in yellow. Uh, it was an educational visit for Eisenhower. He had a, already a deep interest in history. As a young boy, he loved reading about the past and his first visit to Gettysburg only helped to encourage that interest and love of history. The next year after he had graduated from West Point, he would soon meet Mamie Dowd and they were married in 1916, beginning their, their long and eventful lives together. And two years after they were married, they found themselves here in Gettysburg once again, when in 1918, Dwight Eisenhower, then a 27-year-old captain in the U.S. Army, was made the commander of Camp Colt, a tank training camp in the middle of Gettysburg National Military Park. This photograph is showing some of the structures there at Camp Colt. In the background, you can see some of the Gettysburg Battlefield Monuments. Uh, it was a challenging assignment for Eisenhower. It was not one that he initially wanted. He preferred to be in France during World War I. But being here at Camp Colt, he gained some valuable leadership lessons that he would obviously employ uh, later on in his illustrious career. Of course, the Eisenhower that most of us know, or best, is best known, of course, uh, for his two main uh, things in history, his two main achievements, even though he had a, a very eventful life. He's best known as being the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, during the Second World War, a five-star general. Uh, this photograph known to so many, a picture of General Eisenhower speaking to paratroopers from the 101st Airborne Division on June 5th, just hours before the Normandy invasion would be taking part or going underway. Uh, Eisenhower speaking to these soldiers uh, on the eve of D-Day. And of course, his success during World War II as Supreme Allied Commander, becoming one of the most admired uh, men in the country and really in the world led to him in the early 1950s, in 1952, being elected the 34th president of the United States. And that's where our story here at the Eisenhower site comes in, because in those years in between the Second World War and when Eisenhower was elected president, he and Mamie bought this charming, small 189-acre farm here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, thinking this would be a perfect retirement home for them. Well, of course, they purchased the property tail end of 1950, 1951, Eisenhower is asked to go back to Europe, this time as Supreme Commander of NATO forces. And the following year, he runs for and is elected President of the United States. 
So as president and first lady, the Eisenhowers had this Gettysburg farm and they decided to use it as a getaway of sorts while they were in the White House. They used it for lots of different things, for rest and relaxation, uh, for recovery after Eisenhower suffered a major heart attack in 1955. But Eisenhower also conducted diplomacy here. He used his property to conduct the business of the American people in reaching out and forming bonds and relationships with other world leaders. This photograph shows Eisenhower and at this point, former British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill here on the property in May of 1959. And while Churchill was an old friend of Eisenhower's, he didn't just bring old friends here to the farm. He also brought uh, individuals with whom he is trying to develop those diplomatic bonds. Individuals like Prime Minister Nehru from India who came here in December of 1956. Uh, he also would bring Nikita Khrushchev here to the property and we'll uh, talk about him again in just a few minutes. But the Eisenhower site today, it does preserve the home and the farm of Dwight and Mamie Eisenhower. And I thought what we'd do is take a few steps virtually inside the Eisenhower home and show you some of the rooms inside the house, because again, it really does speak to who the Eisenhowers were as individuals. So as we virtually head through the front door here, wow. So now we're in the entrance hall of the Eisenhower home. On the left, you can see some very fancy ornate wallpaper with the seals of 49 of the 50 states and territories. Eisenhower was the president who did add the 49th and 50 of states, Hawaii and Alaska. On the right, you can see there is a small stand with a guest book on it. They encouraged all visitors to sign in at their guest book. We won't ask our virtual visitors to sign in today, but it was a nice welcoming ritual there at the Eisenhower home uh, being asked to sign in. Even the grandchildren were asked to sign in when they came to visit grandma and grandpa at their Gettysburg house. The living room was the most formal of the rooms in the house still is. You're seeing it as it is preserved today. Many of their uh, items given to them by other world leaders and dignitaries are on display there in that room. One of my favorites is actually on the bottom of your screen. It's a small coffee table given specifically to Mamie Eisenhower by Mrs. Singman Rhee, the first lady of South Korea. She gave it to Mamie as a token of appreciation to the Eisenhowers or President Eisenhower's efforts at bringing the fighting to a close in Korea during his first year as president in 1953. When Eisenhower ran for the presidency, of course, the Korean War was a major ongoing uh, event at the time. Eisenhower, using his military experience, really wanted to try to bring that fighting to a close, uh, the act of hostilities to a close in his first year in office in 1953. The white marble fireplace that you're seeing there actually was originally part of the East Room of the White House, where it was on display uh, for about 20 years or so in the mid 19th century. It was actually in the East Room during the Lincoln administration and the years of the American Civil War. Now the Eisenhower's favorite room in their home was what you're seeing right here, the sun porch. Originally it was an exterior room. They had it enclosed because they loved spending time there so much. It had perfect lighting for reading, for playing cards, visiting with guests, and as you can see from the easel setup, for painting as well. Uh, a lot of our visitors are surprised to learn that President Eisenhower was an avid painter and artist. He painted uh, quite a lot over the last 20 years or so of his life, about 200 or more paintings during that time span. He found it was a great avenue to relax his mind and handle his stress, which certainly as President of the United States, you would need something like that. But this is also a room where they would, again, host world leaders, including in September of 1959, a visit from Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, uh, who in this black and white photograph is pictured here standing with President Eisenhower at Camp David uh, when he was visiting the area. Ike brought Khrushchev to his Gettysburg farm as a means of breaking the ice and getting to know him a little bit better. And right here on the sun porch, the same room you're viewing, uh, Eisenhower introduced Khrushchev to his four grandchildren, who I like to refer to as Ike's four secret weapons in the Cold War in a charm offensive with the Soviet leader trying to uh, get to know him a little bit better. Khrushchev himself really warmed up to the grandkids. So it was a nice move on Eisenhower's part. Upstairs, you're viewing the general's room. This was a private room for Eisenhower's use for relaxing, for reading, for taking uh, naps, which he did uh, after suffering his first heart attack in 1955. Uh, above the bed, you can see there is a painting of his two eldest grandchildren, uh, David and Anne. But Eisenhower was actually a very avid reader. 
uh, in our museum collection, we have over 1,100 of Eisenhower's personal books, over 900 of which are actually on display in the Eisenhower home. Uh, it, we have more books on display than any other single item in the house. So it certainly speaks to who Eisenhower was and speaks to his interests as an avid reader, uh, something that you can learn by visiting the home of a general and a president. Here is the Eisenhower's master bedroom. Again, there's another painting of the grandchildren that is David, Anne, and Susan uh, over the fireplace here. But it reflects their shared interests and personalities, a combination of their favorite colors. Uh, Mamie, of course, loving the color pink with the curtains and the bed sheets, and General Eisenhower loving the color green. So that is how the bedroom was decorated. Also notice the antique television set in the corner. A lot of visitors really find those uh, very interesting to see inside the house, uh, a, a object of a bygone era for sure. On the other side of the home, we're not necessarily covering every single room here today, but on the other side of the home, uh, this is actually one of the more popular rooms with our visitors. It's the Eisenhower Den. Uh, some of the floorboards and ceiling beams in this room were from the original home that the Eisenhowers purchased when they bought this farm before they were president and first lady. They ultimately had most of the house rebuilt due to its age, but they were able to salvage some of the original wood and use it here in this room. Uh, it was a, a great room for reading and relaxing and also on occasion holding some meetings uh, with some friends and confidants to discuss important, important uh, ongoing events in the Eisenhower's lives and certainly in his professional career as president of the United States. But a lot of our visitors are drawn to it because it is a very rustic feel and it reminds us of Eisenhower uh, having a, a fondness for Western and rustic things. This is one of my favorite rooms in the entire home. It's, it's the president's office, and it's perhaps one of the smallest rooms in the home as well, which I think uh, catches many visitors by surprise, the idea that a president of the United States would have such a small office in his personal home. A uh, couple interesting things to point out here. First of all, again, more books on display. Again, over 900 of Eisenhower's personal books are on display in the home itself. The desk was actually made for President Eisenhower out of pine boards that were taken from the White House during its renovation during the Truman administration. And the desk is modeled after one used by George Washington. And Washington was a particular hero of General Eisenhower's. Uh, so it certainly was a gift of great value and meaning for Eisenhower himself. I think there's some similarities between the Washington story and the Eisenhower story and that they were each uh, generals, victorious generals, uh, receiving great acclaim after a victory in a war, the revolution in the Second World War, who uh, sought a, a life of farming, but instead were called to further public service by serving as president of the United States. Eisenhower did use this as a working office on occasion during his presidency. Uh, altogether, he spent over 365 days, either all of the day or a part of the day, at his farm while he was president of the United States. So we can say about a year of his presidency was spent here in Gettysburg at his peaceful, tranquil property. Taking a step outside of the Eisenhower home, one of our other most popular features. Uh, yes, Eisenhower did have his very own putting green on the farm. Uh, as many of our visitors do know, Eisenhower loved the game of golf, played hundreds of rounds of golf while he was president of the United States. It was a great way, again, for him to relax and get some exercise, uh, a favorite pastime of his. In the mid-1950s, the PGA essentially uh, agreed to arrange to have this, this green built for Eisenhower as a thank you for everything he was doing to publicize the game of golf. Uh, when the president is an avid golf fan, it certainly does help to gain some popularity for the sport. Behind the putting green, you can see uh, the Eisenhower Bank Barn, it was built in 1887. So it was actually built before Eisenhower himself was even born. So it's one of our uh, older structures, our oldest standing structure here at the site, and uh, certainly a, a great feature for us. On the side of the barn, there is a garage with some of the Eisenhower vehicles on display. And if you're looking to come and visit us this summer, as a little teaser for you, uh, especially on weekend days and other days we have staffing available, we're hoping to open up the garage doors to let visitors have a better look at some of the original Eisenhower vehicles on display. So have to throw that out there as an as a advertisement and teaser to encourage you to come and visit us this year. 
Eisenhower had several pride and joys here at his Gettysburg farm. He, of course, loved reading. He loved painting. But he also loved the farm itself. He said he wanted to buy a piece of land and, and leave a piece of land better than he found it. And really, his focus was his Black Angus cattle show herd. You can see here uh, photograph some of the ribbons his herd won. And the other photograph here is Eisenhower showing some of his cattle to German Chancellor Conrad Adenauer during a visit here in Gettysburg. When Eisenhower hosted these world leaders at his Gettysburg farm, he did enjoy taking them out to the cattle farm itself, showing them the cows. He really took a lot of pride in that. It was a, a favorite pastime of his here in Gettysburg. And another pastime of his, one of his other favorite activities was his family. He did love spending time with his family here. The Eisenhowers had two children. Uh, their firstborn child, a little boy named Dowd, died at the age of three in 1921. In 1922, their son John was born and he passed away in 2013. Uh, John had four children, so there are four Eisenhower grandchildren, David, Anne, Susan, and Mary Jean. And uh, they do often stop by and, and pay us a visit from time to time. So we do get to still see the Eisenhower grandkids stopping by the farm here. And of course here pictured Ike and Mamie with three of the grandchildren uh, at their farm here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. They did very much cherish their time together as a family here. And this farm in that sense, again, it really does emphasize who the Eisenhowers were as individuals, their unique interests, uh, their personalities. Uh, and I think for, especially for uh, Eisenhower himself, when you think about him as a leader, and what sorts of traits and qualities a good leader has. Well, certainly he's very family focused. Uh, he loved to read. He loved to be very well prepared and well versed on issues he was dealing with. Uh, and again, that idea of taking care of a piece of land and leaving it better than he found it really speaks to his values and his interests as well. And simply having a farm in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania is interesting for a leader of Eisenhower's stature, uh, someone who had overseen uh, so much fighting during the Second World War, looking for a retirement farm here in Gettysburg, adjacent to the Civil War battlefield, not only shows us that Eisenhower had a deep interest in the American Civil War, but just a deep wanting to connect with American history. And that's something that so many of our visitors identify with and share with General Eisenhower himself. Here you're seeing Ike and Mamie, two separate historic photographs, one in front of the Eisenhower home, one taken just outside the sun porch behind it. After leaving the presidency in 1961, uh, over a decade after they bought the place, finally Ike and Mamie were able to use this farm as the retirement home they had dreamed of. So they spent the 1960s here mostly at their farm in Gettysburg. They would spend their winters uh, in Southern California. They deeded the property to the National Park Service. So when visitors ask us, uh, you know, why is this a National Park Service site? Who can we thank for this beautiful National Park Service site? Well, you can thank uh, Dwight and Mamie Eisenhower, yet another thing you can uh, thank them for because they saw to it that this was donated to the American people for them to see and enjoy. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower himself passed away in March of 1969. Mamie continued living here in Gettysburg until November of 1979 when she passed away. And in the summer of 1980, the Eisenhower National Historic Site opened up to the public. And we uh, since then have been uh, conducting tours of the home, programming, and helping to share the legacy and the story of the Eisenhower family here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It's a town that so many associate with 1863, of course, the very famous Battle of Gettysburg, uh, the visit of Abraham Lincoln. Um, but as you can see here in this uh, photograph of President Eisenhower coming through the town square, uh, the town of Gettysburg certainly did love General Eisenhower and President Eisenhower and uh, continues to still love Eisenhower uh, to this day. So I would encourage visitors who are looking to engage more with the Eisenhower story. Uh, if you are watching this on Facebook Live, odds are you are familiar with our Facebook site. Uh, but be sure to check out our park website as well, www.nps.gov slash EISE. It's a great place to visit before you plan your own visit to the Eisenhower site in person. And we also have lots of wonderful virtual resources there uh, for our visitors who are looking to learn more about who Dwight and Mamie Eisenhower were and about their legacy of leadership for our country here.
So with, with that introduction to the site, I do see there's a few questions in the chat feature. I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, stop my screen share and uh, perhaps we can uh, jump in and, and answer some of those questions. Yeah, that sounds great. So Daniel, we're gonna bring on now Ben Kellerhals. He's our intern here with uh, Journey Through Hallowed Ground and he's gonna be uh, bringing some of the questions for you. Yeah, hi, Daniel. That was a great presentation. And like I told you before we got started, this is one of my favorite historic sites to visit. So let's see um, if we can get through some questions. Um, pretty active chat, so let's see what we can get ourselves to. Firstly, let's start with this one. Did either of the Eisenhowers drive themselves around town or were they chauffeured? Well, uh, in his retirement years, General Eisenhower did start driving again. Um, he was not a very good driver. Uh, the, as you can imagine, uh, during World War II, not really driving himself a whole lot. As chief of staff of the army in the years after World War II, not driving himself a lot. Uh, as the head of Columbia University, which we didn't talk much about, uh, again, not driving himself a lot. And definitely as president of the United States, not driving a whole lot. So he was definitely very much out of practice. Uh, so uh, they did have chauffeurs sometimes, but he would also drive on occasion when he was heading into town. Uh, the Secret Service would call ahead to where he was headed and make sure they had several spaces saved for him so the uh, former president could find a place to park. All right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. He wouldn't have too much chance to drive. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, was a document recently discovered in a chair in the den? Uh, yes, uh, actually it was. Yeah, it was, um, it was just a Facebook post about it on our page. Uh, our, our cleaning staff was going through and they, they found a, a document in the, in the den. I believe it was uh, for a show of some sort, an advertisement that we believe fell out of a, a magazine Eisenhower was reading. I don't have the specific uh, document in front of me, but if you, if you go to our Facebook page, I'll plug that again here, even though you're watching this on Facebook, but our, our curator, Mike Floor, does a great job uh, doing a Museum Monday post on Facebook every Monday. So look for those. And he actually just recently did one on that document um, and you can see see the whole story about it. Now you mentioned uh, you still have I think you said 1100 books and so with that we have a question about who his favorite authors were and perhaps what some of his reading trends were if any stuck out. Yeah yeah absolutely so uh, Ike loved reading when he was young he loved, loved reading ancient history um, as he grew his interest grew somewhat he had a couple trends. He loved reading military history. So if you go through the Eisenhower book collection, you'll see there's a lot of books on the Revolutionary War and the Civil War in particular. A lot of stuff that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, stuff by Bruce Catton, Douglas Southall Freeman, who's actually a friend of Eisenhower's. So loved reading military history. Uh, he also had books from personal friends, like he had multiple volumes given to him by Winston Churchill. We have original books that Churchill signed and gave to Eisenhower as gifts that Churchill himself wrote. Uh, but he also loved reading Westerns. He loved watching Westerns on TV, like Gunsmoke and Bonanza, but he loved reading Western novels. And it was a preferred method of his for relaxing in the evenings, uh, falling asleep while thumbing through the pages of a Western novel, which when you think about the amount of uh, stuff he's doing on a daily basis, you know, managing Operation Overlord in 1944. Uh, you kind of need something non-military history to read in the evening. So a Western novel will do just that for you. Um, and if you go to our, our park website, we actually have an article, uh, Reading the Man, Dwight Eisenhower's Love of Books, that talks about his reading interests. And on that article, there's a link that has a full display of all the books on display in the Eisenhower home. So check that out on our park website. Nice, very interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, was there any protection there for the Eisenhowers when they returned in 61 before the Secret Service was assigned to do so? Not really. There were a couple Pennsylvania State Police officers, uh, but that was about it. So uh, when the Eisenhowers left the White House January of 1961, the day of Kennedy's inauguration. The Secret Service escorted them up here to Gettysburg, saw them to the front gate, and then said bye-bye. Uh, at that time, former presidents did not have Secret Service protection. Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of protection here for several years. After the assassination of President Kennedy, 
the law was changed so that former presidents would have Secret Service protection. So the Secret Service returned here uh, following the Kennedy assassination. I believe it was early 1965, they, they fully returned. And the Secret Service stayed on through the rest of President Eisenhower's life, and they also stayed on through the rest of Mamie's life in the 1970s. So, and around the property, there are several things to see that speak to the Secret Service story here. There's an old cinder block milk shed attached to that bank barn that we saw that the Secret Service agents used as an office uh, that is open to the public most days during our normal tour season. Uh, and you can step inside and see the equipment they used and the surveillance equipment around the property. It's very, very interesting. And there's also several Secret Service guard shacks uh, still around the property. So when you come into the farm, you'll actually drive through a gate and right there, there's a Secret Service guard shack. Very interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it seems we have these two questions are sort of similar, so I'll, I'll combine them for you. Um, one being, um, how often did the, did the Nixons and other presidents visit the farm? And, and another one asking if Eisenhower had a regular golf buddies at Gettysburg. You know, he did have regular golf buddies, um, you know, friends, business partners, uh, things like that. He loved playing at the Gettysburg Country Club, but he played a lot of different places as well. Um, his, his golf games, you know, again, a lot of personal acquaintances, some of whom were, you know, leaders of major corporations, things like that, uh, his political inner circle. Um, so, yeah, he did kind of have his regular golf circle. Uh, as far as visitors to the farm, uh, the Nixons did visit on occasion. I don't have the, the list of all the different days they did visit. Um, they continued to visit actually after Eisenhower passed. They, they visited on occasion um, after, after Ike's passing. Um, uh, other, other presidents did visit, uh, though not while they were in office per se. Um, Kennedy and Eisenhower met at Camp David a couple times uh, right after Ike left office. Uh, Ronald Reagan came and visited the farm in 1966 when he was a California politician before he was, of course, president of the United States. Uh, and another, another uh, visitor was Gerald Ford, who came here as a congressman in 1961, and he eulogized Eisenhower on the floor of the House after the general's passing in 1969. And in his remarks, he talked about coming here shortly after Ike had left office and bringing his, his sons so they could meet uh, General Eisenhower. And uh, in, in, in their meeting, um, Ike, Ike offered basically a tour of the Gettysburg battlefield for them and a long lengthy discussion of Gettysburg which they were not expecting. And I think that really speaks to Eisenhower's generosity of spirit and his character. So uh, several future presidents visited as well, um, in addition to the, the Nixon's visiting on occasion. So lots of, lots of very famous visitors here at the Eisenhower farm. Yeah, most certainly. Um, let's see, you, we touched on the books. Um, how many pieces in the house or what pieces in the house are original? So we have thousands of items on display and probably 96, 97% of them are original. And we can thank the Eisenhowers again for that because not only did Dwight and Mamie agree to donate this property to the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service, but after their passings, the Eisenhower family really saw to it that most of their items did go to the National Park Service. And they've been wonderful partners in helping to preserve this site and, uh, preserve so many original items. It's really a, a very, very uh, treasured place because of that. Wow, yeah. And, and with that, uh, on a similar note, I seem to remember from visiting in 2018, a very hot pink bathroom. And mm -hmm. we have a question concerning um, how this home reflected the average upper or high class home of the 1950s. Gosh, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, I would say it's probably pretty representative of the time in terms of the, the floor plan, the decorating style, the, the spacing, the technology on display. But, but like any home, it's also a unique reflection of who the Eisenhowers were. I don't think, uh, not necessarily every upper class family or, or middle class family had a hot pink bathroom. Um, so Mamie obviously did, and Ike had his own bathroom, which was a, a green color uh, as a theme. So. I know the kitchen was a, was a very sought after style. It's a small kitchen by many standards today, 
Um, today, it's very popular and in vogue to have an open floor plan and a big kitchen with lots of counter space and this and that. And their kitchen is very, very small by comparison. We didn't have a, a photograph of it earlier, but very small by comparison, but very popular and uh, modern style at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and on a, another similar note, I suppose we have a question concerning what vehicles would be on display. Yeah, so we have a uh, limousine used during their presidential years from the 1950s. Uh, there's a Buick station wagon from the 1960s on display in the garage. And I think the most interesting item, you saw that picture earlier with the picture of Ike and Churchill uh, driving around the property, a Crosley runabout, a Surrey with the fringe on top. That is, that is on display as well, along with a couple other golf carts that Eisenhower used to ferry these world leaders around the farm. Uh, especially in Churchill's case, when he visited in May of 59, he was so, so advanced in age, he really couldn't walk much. So uh, right off the helicopter, they got Churchill into a small golf cart. They got him into a bigger golf cart to drive him over to the cattle farm, uh, drove him right up to the front door of the house in a golf cart. Uh, so yeah, Ike loved, loved driving around the property uh, with his golf cart and showing, showing off his cattle herd to world leaders. So uh, the golf carts to me, I think are, are very cool, though I guess others might find the the uh, 60s uh, station wagon and the presidential limousine equally cool. Very interesting, very interesting. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, um, you, you might have touched on this, but we did have a question of, um, from early on concerning why exactly they chose Gettysburg, I mean, of all places. So yeah, I, I think Gettysburg was an ideal spot for them for several reasons. Uh, you know, first of all, they had lived here before in 1918 when Eisenhower commanded Camp Colt. He and Mamie lived in the town. They developed a fondness for the area and there was a sense of wanting to return here uh, from that time. Uh, you know, when they lived here in 1918, um, they were here with their firstborn child, a little boy named Dowd. And this was one of the only places where they lived with Dowd, whose nickname was Icky. So I think after his passing, there was also an angle of Gettysburg as a place where we have some memories of Icky as well, and maybe returning there. But definitely a familiarity with the area from 1918, uh, a love of history, certainly. Um, so many uh, history buffs and uh, people who visit the site today say, oh, wow, I wish I had a house that bordered Gettysburg National Military Park. Well, when you're the former Supreme Allied Commander in Europe during World War II, you can get that house. Um, but uh, for Eisenhower, he really jumped at the chance to, to buy this property, uh, this 189 acre farm right next to the battlefield. Um, there wasn't any necessarily heavy fighting on the property per se, but a lot of troop movement through the farm during the battle. So for Ike, that was a big selling point as well. And he also very much really wanted to be a farmer in his retirement. That quote, I you know leave a piece of ground better than he found it. That reflected his personality and his interests after World War II. Uh, he, he didn't necessarily have a burning desire to be president when they bought this property, even though a year later he was elected president. So you know, his interest in farming, his interest in history, his familiarity with the Gettysburg area. And the other box that it checked for them was in retirement, Eisenhower wanted to be away from Washington, but also not too far away. In the event that he was needed uh, to be called upon to give advice or help out with something, he wanted to be, you know, within a day's travel. And Gettysburg certainly fits that as well. Yeah. Perfect for, for many reasons. Um, mm -hmm. we, you know, we have a very, I'm uh, combining some questions here again, but we have a very active chat today. And I think it reflects the sentiment of this question, this line of questioning, which is that how as a site do you deal with the increasing political nature of even telling history and the viewpoints of it? Uh, Ike was in many ways a trailblazer himself and does it get controversial? Is there a shared love for someone like Ike that crosses all those boundaries or what does that look like? Well, gee, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, as, as my colleague, uh, Alice is fond of saying, you know, when we talk to visitors, uh, you know, we, our politics stop at, at 1969, because that's when uh, Eisenhower passed, but certainly his legacy lives on in, in so many ways. And I think that um, it's an interesting, interesting story to tell um, Eisenhower always sought the middle way. Uh, he, he really tried to find compromise in different areas. 
And a lot of visitors are very drawn to Ike. Um, certainly he was not without his flaws. Not every issue that he touched ended up going exactly the way he wanted. Um, there were things that he perhaps could have done a better job at. There's criticism of his record on civil rights, for example, that he was not speaking out strongly enough in the early days of the, the big civil rights push of the 1950s and 1960s. Um, that, that being said, even despite those flaws, I think a lot of our visitors do see Eisenhower as a, as a nostalgic figure, someone who they still uh, have a lot of admiration for, because he was someone who did try to get along and work with others. Um, Eisenhower admired Lincoln because he said Lincoln never uh, shouted down another American. He never, there was never a time where he pounded the table or, or, or did something like that. Um, it, you know, he certainly uh, he, he appreciated Lincoln's calm leadership style in that sense. So Eisenhower uh, tried to work with others as best as he could. And really that's what he made his career on, uh, working with others, whether it's getting all these allied commanders to work together during World War II, uh, some of whom had very prickly personalities and divergent interests, or trying to work with, with Congress and trying to work as president of the United States and bring people together. He sought that middle way. And I think a lot of visitors do uh, come here and appreciate that about Eisenhower still. So uh, we try to emphasize his leadership qualities of, of humility and working, working with others as part of his story. So hopefully, hopefully that ad addresses that question. Oh, certainly. I think even uh, just speaking personally for a moment, even as in college circles, history circles, Ike is pretty beloved, you know, but yeah, that the reverence um, lives on. Yeah, his, you know, and we talk about presidential rankings, you know, like it's, it's, yeah. it's tough to rank presidents. It's, you know, you can't have like the college football committee ranking presidents, but historians try to do this. Um, and just in the last 10, 20 years or so, Eisenhower's ranking amongst presidents as given by academic and professional historians has really escalated. And some, some lists he's now widely regarded as being in the top 10 of American presidents. Um, his efforts at keeping the Cold War cold instead of uh, letting new active conflicts erupt at that time, uh, managing a lot of things, creating NASA, the interstate highway system. It was really a very consequential presidency at a consequential time in history. So now there's some lists I've seen he's ranked as, as high as fifth. So certainly he's a very, very admired figure still. Certainly. And uh, building off of that, what do you see as the main takeaway when people come and visit this site? What do you hope that takeaway is? Well, I hope it's a sense, first of all, of how peaceful and, and well-preserved it is here, because it's the National Park Service, that is our goal to still preserve the Eisenhower farm and, and keep this a beautiful historic piece of property. But I, also, I, I do hope it's also a sense of being able to connect with that, that legacy of, of leadership. Um, in, our, in our programming here, especially our student programming, uh, when we talk to students about Eisenhower and D-Day, um, talk about that order of the day he wrote on the eve of the invasion, uh, soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. And we asked them what, what that great crusade was they were fighting for in 1944. And try to talk about how leadership connects with, with goals and achievements and what those achievements are for. And I think one question, you know, I want students to walk away from programming here at the site is, what's our great crusade today? Uh, you know, and Eisenhower led this great crusade to liberate a continent in 1944. And as president of the United States, he was one of these World War II veterans, whether you were a sergeant in the 101st Airborne or the Supreme Allied Commander, these veterans came home and tried to perfect that freedom they had fought for uh, overseas. And he was still tried to perfect that great crusade and, and help preserve freedom and democracy and improve the lives of others. And I think that was Eisenhower's great crusade that he contributed to through those leadership qualities and characteristics of working with others uh, finding that common ground, that middle way, uh, trying to leave things better than he found it. So showing this property and how well it's preserved, you know, this is a piece of land that Eisenhower worked to leave better than he found it. What's, what's our piece of property that we're going to work to leave better than we find it today? Either a literal piece of ground or something larger. What's our great crusade we're going to work towards? I think seeing this farm and how well it's preserved and learning about Eisenhower's thoughts on leadership 
to me, that's a question I want visitors to walk away with. You know, sometimes you don't want visitors leaving with questions unanswered. Um, questions like, you know, uh, what year was he elected? Obviously, we can answer that question. But sometimes you want visitors to walk away with some unanswered questions. And I think that's, uh, that's one that I, I have. How, how can we leave something better than we found it today? Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, that's very well said. And hopefully everyone can get that experience even virtually to some extent. Um, with that, I think we'll transition to our last question, boring. I don't think I'm missing any in our chat. And that would be um, for you, Daniel, uh, how did you end up here? What advice might you have for someone uh, trying to do something similar uh, with their careers and work with such a cool site and with such cool histories? Uh, gosh, um, I would say probably luck and persistence. Uh, so I, I've worked at, for the National Park Service for uh, 12 years now. I've worked at Antietam National Battlefield in Maryland, worked at Gettysburg National Military Park just on the other side of the tree line here. And I've now worked here at the Eisenhower site for four years. So I guess I would say if uh, you have a passion for working in the history field, um, certainly it's not easy. There's all sorts of of, uh, of issues impacting the history field and jobs in it, but uh, you know, pursue your your passions, work at things not just for the sake of of, uh, of an, an end result, but also work at things and, and find projects to work on that also improve who you are and and uh, find hard work worth doing, as I think Teddy Teddy Roosevelt would say. So. Daniel, that was great. Thank you so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate it. And you sold me on the opening of the garage. So I'm looking forward yeah. to come out. And if, if I may just interject quickly, uh, for those who are wishing, um, we do get asked a lot, what's our, our operating status this year? Uh, May 27th, house tours are restarting. Uh, you can check it out on our website. Uh, shuttle buses will start running May 27th for regular house tour programming. But we're also offering lots of other great programming this year at the site. Uh, we're bringing back our World War II weekend living history event this September. So go to nps.gov slash EISE for all those details and come out and visit us this year. Come out and, and uh, hang out with Ike and Mamie. That's great. Coming up. So looking forward to it. Da Daniel, thank you again. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And everyone at home, uh, we'll see you back here next week. Same time as we continue our tour throughout the journey. So have a wonderful rest of your day.